Well, we come now to the transfiguration itself, uh, brethren and sisters, and we're going to see some marvellous things, not just from the event, because you see the mistake can be made of focusing on the event and not what it was meant to teach. So at the end of this session, we're going to have a look at the lesson that was intended. So the second half of this session, at least, is going to be about that. And we're going to see why it was that Moses and Elijah were actually at the transfiguration, and not Abraham or David or some other of the great servants of God in the past. Why Moses and Elijah? And we're going to see that the secret of that teaches the lesson concerning the transfiguration. So we had a look in our last slide in the previous study of the context of the transfiguration itself. Verse 28 of chapter 16, which Brother David has just read for us, is a promise by Christ that there were some standing there listening to the discourse that we've considered in Matthew 16 who would not taste of death till they saw the kingdom of God come. And of course, it's the transfiguration that he means because Peter, James and John went up with him and they saw Christ as they will see him in the kingdom. And they will be there because he promised them in Matthew 19.28 that you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Peter, James and John, amongst the others, will be there to rule with Christ to see him in his glory in that day. So what they see is a vision. So what they see is what they will see in the kingdom. It's not... Reality, it wasn't that Christ was made immortal. He was appeared. He appeared before them as an immortal. It was indeed a vision. I know there's differences of opinion about that, but by the time I'm finished, you probably might share my, my view of that matter. But anyway, we're not going to talk so much about that. We're going to talk about why Moses and Elijah were actually there. It is the time of the apocalypse of Christ, verse 2. He was transfigured. There's our word, metamorpho, transformed. So it's his revelation in glory that we see. His, his face shone like the sun of righteousness that he is, Malachi 4, verses 1 and 2, and his, his garments were as white as light. It's the chapter in which we have the context of the resurrection of the dead, because in verses 6 and 7 we read this, that when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Now it's in Daniel chapter 10 that we read that Daniel, when he saw a vision of the glory of Christ in the kingdom, in the vision of the man of the one, that he then fell on his face as though he were dead. But what happens in verse 7? Jesus came and touched them. That's what happened to Daniel. One like the Son of Man came and touched him, see? And he was in a figure raised from the dead. He said to them, Arise, be not afraid. So it's in that context of the resurrection of the dead that this transfiguration occurs. The saints appear with him in glory. Verse 3, Behold, there appeared Moses and Elijah talking with him. Elijah comes and restores Israel. Verse 11, we read, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. Of course, Elijah's work will be done. Just prior to Armageddon it will begin, and of course it will be fulfilled after Armageddon, in the time of the revelation of the glory of Christ. We read then of a great mountain in Matthew 17, verse 20. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place. Now the mountain in the vicinity, of course, was Mount Hermon. It was a place of, at that time, when he was there, it was a place of pagan worship. So who would be the vehicle of paganism in the modern world that Christ will destroy to establish the kingdom? The great mountain of Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7. Babylon the great. That's the mountain that's got to be removed. You've got faith that that's going to happen? Well you're going to be there to see it if you've got that kind of faith. Mankind is cured of falling sickness in Matthew 17, 15 to 18. In our exhortation tomorrow... Uh, God willing, we're going to have a look at Mark chapter 9, an incredible enacted parable of the healing of the human race through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, all in the aftermath of the transfiguration, as we shall see. And the mustard seed of verse 20, the universal kingdom, of course, it speaks of, that is the culmination of the glory of Christ. So this is the context in which we find the transfiguration occurring. So, here are the transfiguration characters. Let's just drill down a little on some of the characters that appear in this record. 
Well, clearly Christ as king priest in glory and honour has got to be at the head of that list. Then we've got Moses. Now Moses, we know, died and was buried. So he represents the glorified saints who enter the kingdom through resurrection from the dead. He will be raised from the dead. And of course we know he will be in the kingdom. But Elijah represents the glorified saints who enter the kingdom by translation. That is, those who are alive and remain at the return of Christ. Now Elijah is as dead as a doorknob. Now I know that some don't think so, but he's as dead as a doorknob. He has to be raised along with the rest of those that are responsible uh, to judgment. And he'll be glorified. But you see, he was taken. He was taken in the middle of his ministry, just like you and I are going to be taken in the middle of our ministry, of our service. We're not going to get to the end of our service. Most of us, some of us might die, but I don't think too many of us in this room are going to die before Christ comes. So we'll be taken in the middle of our ministry, just like Elijah. So he represents that class of saints in the latter days. The three disciples that are there, Peter, James and John, represent mortal Jews who will see the glory of Christ first. And it will be on a mountain that they'll see that glory because when he comes and the Mount of Olives divides, there's the first thing, that's a negative thing, it divides and is flattened, but as a result of that, Mount Zion is exalted. The very first thing he does is to place the throne of David at the foot of that mountain and the Jews will come to him and say, who are you? And he'll show them the wounds in his hands of the sufferings of Christ and they'll see the glory that's been established there. So that's what's going to happen. So these three disciples represent mortal Jews who see the glory first. The other disciples who are down the bottom of the mountain represent Israel outside the land who are waiting, waiting for Christ to deal with them. And of course he will eventually deal with them. The multitude that are with them represent the mortal nations who will seek Christ in the events following his manifestation on Mount Zion. Well here we've got Mount Hermon, the Mount of transfiguration and this of course is the place where this event occurs Uh, a marvellous thing to have been there it's like Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 he says look we can't really describe what we saw it's just beyond description really but we saw his glory and his majesty and we heard the great voice of God on that mountain but let's just take a step back because it says in Matthew 17 verse 1 And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James and John, etc. Mark chapter 9 is the next gospel record that deals with the transfiguration. And it says, and after six days. But the third record is in Luke chapter 9. And in verse 28 we read, It came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. You're going to read carefully. After these sayings. What sayings? Well, the discourse of Matthew chapter 16. That's the sayings referred to. So what's going on here? We've got Matthew and Mark saying it was six days, after six days, and Luke saying it came to pass about eight days after these sayings. Why the discrepancy in the dating? Well, there's reasons for that. Matthew and Mark use the exclusive dating method exclusive. That is, they only talk about six full days, not the bit of the day before or the bit of the day after, just the six days. While Luke uses the inclusive method, that is, he puts the the bits and pieces of the day before and the day after in there. Now you see these eight days down the bottom here? We have eight days. So this is the way it works, brothers and sisters. Six days intervening between the discourse, these sayings of Matthew 16, and the transfiguration, which occurs on the night of the seventh day and running into the eighth. Alright? So that's the, that's the way you understand the six days. These six days here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those are the six days referred to by Matthew and Mark after these sayings, Matthew 16 occurs here. Got it? But when you come to Luke, he says something different. So the six days prefigures the 6,000 year history of man before the apocalypse of Christ in glory 
And the eight days points forward to the culmination of this in the time beyond the millennium. The great eighth day in the divine scheme, which of course he refers to 2 Peter 3 verse 8. When he talks about the formula, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And the eighth day is the time of perfection when God is all and in all and the work of Christ will have been brought to its culmination. So in these two ways of expressing it, we have two things being taught. That he will be revealed after 6,000 years of human history and he will lead the world through the millennium to the time when God is all and in all. So that's pointing to this period here. We're getting up towards the eighth day. So it's in the evening, the night of the seventh day, that the transfiguration occurs. About, it says. It doesn't say eight. It says about eight days after. Got it? Okay, I know that that might be a bit difficult to understand when you first look at that, but that's what it's teaching, looking at these two wonderful eras. The revelation of Christ at the end of the sixth day and the culmination at the end of the seventh. So let's now come and have a look at why Moses and Elijah were here at the Transfiguration and not some other of the great servants of our God in the past. Was it because they represented the law and the prophets? Moses the law, Elijah the prophets? Was it because they are both leaders of an exodus? And Christ, we know, in Luke chapter 9 verse 31 uses the same word that Peter later on uses in 2 Peter 1.15 when he says, I'm going to have an exodus, right? Christ had to complete his exodus, and we'll talk more about this tomorrow morning, God willing. Was it because they were both leaders of an exodus, Moses of the first and Elijah of the second exodus of Israel? Were they the reasons? Or were there more important reasons as to why Moses and Elijah were there? Well, the latter is true. Because both Moses and Elijah were taught a very vital lesson on a mountain, in a cave, in the very same cave, I believe, both of them, on Mount Horeb. And we're going to see why it was that these two men were called upon to be there. Now, they weren't physically, literally there. Moses died. He was buried. He was not resurrected to go up onto the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there in a vision, but a vision in which he was seen as he will be seen when he has been resurrected and immortalised. In glory, it says. They appeared with him in glory. Now, I understand by glory, immortality. And Moses and Elijah were certainly not there as immortals. But they were seen in a vision. Now, people wonder about this. But let me just put it to you this way. When Ezekiel was walked around the temple in Ezekiel 40 through 48, when he was walking around the temple, he would have sworn black and blue that he could see it, it was there, he could touch it. He saw tables, he saw sacrifices on the table, there was a man walking him around, he walked through water, he walked up and down, he saw it as though it was there. Was the temple there? No. But the vision that he saw was as real as I am seeing you. That's what God can do. Now, we don't understand that. We don't understand it, but he can do that. And that's what he does here. He puts a vision before the disciples of Christ, as he will be seen in the kingdom, and Moses and Elijah are there sharing his glory. That's how real it was to them. But it wasn't actually real. He couldn't go up and get hold of, of Moses and wring his neck and see if he was immortal. That, that wasn't going to happen. So that, that is what happens here. There's a vision. Now, what's the lesson of this? Why are these two men here? Well, because we're going back to the lesson we learned in 2 Peter chapter 1. Men are not changed for the kingdom by miracles, but by hearing and believing the word of God. And we're going to go to that subject now as we look at these two men. But first of all, let's just ask why Moses and Elijah. Well, they're together in Malachi 4, aren't they? Have a look at Malachi 4, just a few pages back in your Bible. Here we've got them together. Malachi 4. So what's the context of Malachi 4? Verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and the proud, and yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. That's Armageddon. 
And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith Yahweh of armies, that it shall lead them neither root nor branch, but unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth, etc. So it's talking about the day when Christ comes in glory, Armageddon, he's got his saints with him, he's revealed as the Son of righteousness. When he was transfigured, his face shone as the sun. There's no question that that, brothers and sisters, that is what we're looking at here. The time when he comes in glory to be revealed to mankind, having already revealed himself to his servants. Messenger of the covenant. Now in Malachi 3 verse 2 you read this. It says in Malachi 3 and verse 2, But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire, and like full of soap. You know what it says in Mark chapter 9 verse 3? About the garments of Christ that shone? It says, like as no fuller, meaning a dry cleaner, no fuller on earth can whiten them. They were so white. So the language, the language of the transfiguration is picked up from Malachi. And of course, when you come to Malachi chapter 4, you read this in verse 4 concerning Moses. <coughs> Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Remember. Remember what? Remember Moses' miracles? There's no mention here of his miracles. Is there? Did he perform miracles? Yeah, many of them. Before Pharaoh and then in the wilderness. But there's not a single word about Moses' miracles. What is it that's highlighted? The law of God that he gave. That's what changes men. Miracles didn't change the wilderness generation and neither did the word. They didn't listen to the word. They were excited by miracles for a time, then forgot it. And the Bible was not part of their life. That's why they weren't changed. And what about Elijah? Well, he's mentioned in verses 5 and 6 of Malachi 4. So you've got Moses and Elijah together. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And we're going to analyse that in a minute. And then it says this about him. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So here we've got Elijah going out before the judgments begin. What's he going out for? Well, to turn hearts, to try and avoid the curse. Right, that's what he's doing. That's about education. Oh yeah, there'll be miracles in the second exodus and Elijah will be responsible like Moses was. But not about miracles here. They come later. What is it that changes men for the kingdom? The word of God. And that's what he's doing. Elijah goes out to begin the process of changing the hearts and minds. For here you've got this passage. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Now when does he start this? Behold, I will send you Elijah prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day, which is the subject of verses 1 to 3, which is Armageddon. So it's before. Now that word before there is pani. It means the face and therefore in the presence of or before. And some say, oh well, you know, this is, this is about across the face. That Elijah's work is across the 40 years of... Well, of course it is. But when does it begin? Well, the word before is used in this book, Malachi. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. This is the same Hebrew word. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So who's this about? Well, you know, John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, wasn't he? Yes. When did he start his work? Well, three and a half years before Christ came on the scene. That's what that word means there. It's used in Amos chapter 1, verse 1. The prophet began to prophesy two years before the earthquake. That's the word panim. So that's the way it's used. It's, it's about something that precedes another event. And Elijah's work will begin before Armageddon. Now, here's your proof. This passage is cited in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17. So come along to Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, we have the, the citation that is made concerning the birth of John the Baptist. In verse 15 of Luke 1 we read, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled not with the Holy Spirit, because John performed no miracles, 
It should be, it should read, as the diaglot has it, he shall be filled with a spirit of holy or holiness. In other words, a totally dedicated spirit or attitude. And that, of course, encapsulates John. There was probably, apart from Christ, no more singularly dedicated man ever born among women than John the Baptist. That's what that means. And many of the children of Israel, verse 16, shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him, Christ, in the spirit and power of Elijah, and here's your quotation from Malachi 4, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Brother Thomas translates Luke 1, verse 17 this way. To restore to the posterity the father's dispositions. Now, the fathers here are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And disobedient ones, the just person's mode of thinking. And those of you who are quick with fingers, if you have a look at Isaiah 29, you get a feel for what that really means. Isaiah 29 says this in verses 22 and 23. And this is about Jacob. You notice verse 22? It says in verse 22, Therefore thus saith Yahweh, who redeemed Abraham, concerning the house of Jacob, Jacob shall not now be ashamed, neither shall his face now wax pale. Now why would Jacob be ashamed? Well, if Jacob was alive today, and he looked at his posterity... He would be ashamed, wouldn't he, of the behaviour of his people that came from his loins, his children? Yeah, he would be. He would be white of face. But the day will come when they will have ungodliness turned away from them by their Messiah. And so verse 23 says, But when he seeth his children, the work of mine hands, in the midst of him, they shall sanctify my name, and sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and shall fear the God of Israel. So here we've got Jacob, when he's resurrected, he's going to see the work of Elijah, and he's going to see his people turn back to their God. He will no longer be ashamed. Turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Because the children's heart has been turned to be like the heart of their fathers. They've given back the disposition of their fathers. See? The fathers' dispositions have been turned back to obedience so that Jacob will no longer be ashamed of his children. That's what's meant by that statement. Now there are two phases to Elijah's work. And the citation here in Luke chapter 1 from Malachi 4 is very important. Malachi's message was to all Israel, we read in Malachi 4 verse 4. So when you, when you read the phrase all Israel in relation to events of the latter days, because the subject of Malachi 4 is Armageddon, it includes the Jews in the land and the Jews outside the land. Now, well, does Elijah have a work in relation to the Jews in the land? No, because that has already been done. Who did it? Well, John the Baptist did it. John the Baptist was Elijah to Judah. I want to present what the Lord says to his disciples about that. And all that remains is for Elijah to appear to scattered Israel. How can we be sure about that? Well, we've got Matthew 11, verses 13 to 15. For all the prophets and the law until John did prophesy. This is Rotherham's literal translation. And if you're willing to accept it, and they weren't, if you're willing to accept that he, meaning John the Baptist, is Elijah, the one destined to come, he that hath ears, let him hear. Well, the disciples were, dark, were deaf and didn't understand. When Christ said that in Matthew 11, they had no idea what he was talking about. When he says he's the one destined to come, he's referring to Malachi 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day. John the Baptist would do the work of Elijah prior to AD 70, the great day of their time. Elijah, the prophet raised from the dead, will do the work to Israel outside the land prior to the great day of Armageddon. That's what Christ is saying. They had no idea what he was talking about. So in Matthew, he's going to repeat it. And he repeats it in chapter 17. 
Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13. And it's in the context of the transfiguration that he repeats this. His disciples asked him, it says in Matthew chapter 17, and at verse 10, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? Well, obviously, because it says it in Malachi 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them in verse 11, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall the Son of Man suffer of them. Then, finally, the penny drops. The disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. In other words, John was Elijah to Judah, to Jews in the land. And Judah, of course, is the prophetic name of the Jews in the land, especially in the latter days when Christ comes. But there's a problem, and the problem is this. How do we reconcile this declaration by John in John chapter 1, verses 19 to 23, which says this. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Oh, that's a problem, isn't it? No, it's not really. I'll explain to you why it's not a problem. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. They said to him then, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of Isaiah 40, of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So what's the answer to that, brothers and sisters? Well, the answer is this, that he was dealing with Herodians. Herodians, Greekized, Hellenized, Jews. There was a party called the Herodians. And Herod, of course, was the chief of them. That's why he built the temple. He was a Herodian. Yeah? Putting himself forth as a, as a follower of God, the God of Israel. And so what John the Baptist is doing is repudiating Herodian doctrine. Just like Christ does in Matthew 16. Mark 6, 14-16. And King Herod heard of him, namely Christ... For his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. But that wasn't the view of his party, the Herodian party. Others said, it's Elijah. It's actually Elijah. And John the Baptist is saying, I am not Elijah, resurrected Elijah. He's not saying I'm not doing the work of Elijah to the Jews. He's just saying I'm not what you think I am. You think I'm a resurrected Elijah. I'm not. And others said that as a prophet or as one of the prophets, when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Unlike the Sadducees, Herodians, though they were Hellenized, did believe in resurrection. All right? And so... Herod thought that this was John the Baptist raised from the dead after he'd lifted his head from his shoulders in Machaerus. Got the idea? John is not saying I was, I'm not Elijah in any form or any sense. He's saying I'm not what you think I am. You think I'm Elijah raised from the dead. I'm not. But Christ, you see, makes it very plain that John the Baptist was Elijah to the Jews of his day. Now let's come and have a look at what happens to these two men, Moses and Elijah. A very important phrase in the Word of God that is very helpful to be highlighted in your Bible, and I'll show you why in a minute, and it's this phrase, passed by. This phrase connects the record of Moses on Mount Horeb in Exodus 33 and 34 with that of Elijah on the same mountain in 1 Kings 19, Verses 9 to 14. We're going to have a look at both of these contexts in some detail as time permits. And time probably will permit. Well, let's, let's start that process. This phrase, pass by, also links the above events with the call of Elisha to service in Elijah's stead. We'll have a look very quickly at 1 Kings 19 and, of course, 2 Kings chapter 1. 
All of the above laid the foundation for the events of the transfiguration in which Moses and Elijah passed by. And that language is used in Luke chapter 9, as we will see tomorrow morning, God willing. And finally, even the bright cloud and the voice which they heard passed by so that Jesus was found alone. The very embodiment of the Word made flesh. So we're going to find. So this is why Moses and Elijah are there. Because of what happened in their experience on a mountain. In the very same cave, I believe. So let's have a look at it. I want you to come back to Exodus chapter 32, 33 and 34. We're going to start at the end of Exodus 32, which of course is that dreadful chapter that deals with the golden calf apostasy. Moses has been away for 40 days and 40 nights. He returns to find Israel in apostasy. We can only hope that that isn't an accurate type. Christ is about to come back. Let's hope he doesn't find the brotherhood in apostasy like he found them. He comes back and he finds them in apostasy. We know what happens here. He calls upon the Levites to join him and so 3,000 perish and all that sort of stuff. And then Moses goes up to plead for Israel and he goes up for the sixth time into Mount Sinai. And we read what he says when he gets up at the top of Mount Sinai. Verse 31 of chapter 32 says, And Moses returned unto Yahweh and said, O this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and then there's a pause in the record. Notice the line after the word sin. There's a pause in the record. It's as though he stops and thinks, I'm not sure I'm asking for the right thing here. And if not, Block me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. He offers himself as a substitute, brothers and sisters. A substitute for a nation that is guilty of idolatry. Does God accept substitutes? No. Clean flesh theorists think so. Most of the churches think so. But God does not accept substitution when it comes to the forgiveness of sins and redemption. And so Moses' offer is rejected. And God says to him, I don't deal that way, Moses. And you know that. That's why he pauses. You see, he knows God doesn't deal this way. But he's prepared to offer himself as a substitute. Verse 33, Yahweh says to Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So it's the sixth ascent. And six is the number of man. And it's a man's suggestion. A little bit like Peter. This is not going to happen to you, Lord. This is not going to happen to you. Get me behind me, Satan. That's the principle here. Yahweh rejects it. He's not going to accept substitution. But then we read this in verse 34. Therefore now go lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Now, the angel here... Do you notice in verse 34 that the translators have put a capital A... I don't know what what other translations have got, but the AV has got a capital A. Wrong. Wrong. He's not talking about the angel, Michael the archangel, who led Israel into the land. He's talking about a lesser angel. Want proof of that? Have a look at chapter 33, verse 2. Because this is what God says to him. I will send an angel. Notice that? Notice it's a lowercase angel? Yeah. Because what God is saying to Moses is, Moses... I can't walk in the midst of this people. He's actually going to disfellowship them in a moment. I can't walk in the midst of this people. I promised you I would send Michael the Archangel, the one that bears my name, but I can't walk. If he's there, I'm there. I can't walk with this people. I'll send a lesser angel. Not the one that personally represents me, but an angel that will guide them anyway. Moses is very, very upset about this, as you're going to see. So a lesser angel is promised. Now, verse 3 of chapter, of chapter 33 says this, You can go unto a land flowing with milk and honey, that angel will lead you there, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. So what God is about to do is to withdraw the angel of his presence. 
Now we read about this angel just a few chapters back in Exodus. In Exodus 23, we read about him in verse 20. Exodus 23, verse 20 says this. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. You know what he's saying? He's saying that this is what is described in Isaiah 63 verse 9 as the angel of his presence. It's Michael, the archangel he's referring to. So that when Michael was sent by God, it was as though God went himself. That's why when he came to Joshua in Joshua chapter 5 at Jericho, he says, get your shoes off, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Excuse me? It's Jericho, the centre of Nimrod worship. In Canaan, holy ground, come on, pull the other leg. No, just get your shoes off. In Exodus chapter 3, when Moses is at a burning bush, Michael comes to him and says, Get your shoes off! This is holy ground. When he is there, it's as though God is there. He's the angel of Yahweh's presence. So this angel, whom Moses spoke with face to face, as we will see in a moment, is going to be withdrawn. God's going to take him away. And I'll send you a lesser angel. He'll lead you to the land. I'll fulfil my promise. But I will not go. I will not go in the midst of the... You're a stiff-necked people. I'm out of fellowship with you, Israel. That's what he's saying to them. So here you've got a very serious situation developing, haven't you? Moses is horrified by this. In fact, we're going to read that he says we can't make it. We simply can't make it unless that angel of the presence goes with us. Now look at verse 7 of Exodus 33. Exodus 33 verse 7 tells us this. And Moses took... that It says the tabernacle in the AV. Now the word in the Hebrew is ohel. It simply means a tent. The word used for the tabernacle is a mishkan. So here we've got a tent. This is not the tabernacle because that wasn't built until Exodus 35 onwards. So this is a tent that Moses put in the middle of Israel's camp and because the cloud stood above that camp it came down upon that tent and the angel of Yahweh, the angel of his presence, we know from Exodus 14, was in that cloud. He would come down and he would talk with Moses in that tent. It's called here in the record, the tent of meeting. See that phrase there in verse 7, he took the tabernacle. Well, later on it's called in the same verse, he called it the tabernacle of the congregation. Well, this is not the tabernacle that was later on built. This is the tent of meeting. Just like a little tent in which two men might stand together and commune. It is removed to outside the camp. So let's read verse 7. So Moses, and I'll, I'll read it the way it ought to be read. And Moses took this tent of meeting and he pitched it without the camp of Israel, afar off from the camp of Israel, and he called it the tent of meeting. And it came to pass that every one which sought Yahweh went out unto the tent of meeting, which was without the camp. Now you see the emphasis in that verse? It repeats it. It was without the camp. Why? Well, because God had disfellowshipped Israel. So what happens next? Well, the cloud was still above the camp, wasn't it? Let's read on. Verse 7, it says, Everyone that was seeking Yahweh went out to the tent. But then we read this, verse 8. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle or tent that all the people rose up and they stood every man at his tent door and they looked after Moses until he was gone into that tent of meeting that was now outside the camp. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tent of meeting the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of that tent. And Yahweh talked with Moses. So watch this. Here's what's happened. Moses has physically taken the tent and put it outside the camp a long way off. 
Anyone who wants to go and, and, and meet, or have some kind of conference with Yahweh has got to go out there. See the cloud here? Watch the cloud, because what happens now is when Moses puts that tent out there, the cloud leaves the camp and stands above that tent of meeting. So what's going on inside that tent? Well, we know what went on inside that tent because verse 11 tells us. But let's read verse 10 first. You imagine what it would be like for Israelites when they saw, firstly Moses, pull down the tent, pack it up, walk outside the camp, re-erect it, and stayed in it. Then come back to the camp. Then they stand in the tent door and they watch the cloud, which gave them protection from the sun. The cloud moves out and stands above that tent where Moses is. We're out of fellowship. We're out of fellowship. Which is why we do put people out of fellowship that are idolaters or the like. Why? Well, you want to recover them, don't you? If you don't do that, you're not going to recover them. God disfellowships Israel. That's what he does. Not only does Moses signify that, but the cloud. Who's in the cloud? The angel of his presence. He's left the camp. I will not go up in the midst of thee. That's the picture being presented here. Now verse 11 tells us this. And Yahweh spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And then it says, And he turned again into the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tent of meeting. So Moses and Joshua are out here. The people recognise their sin. See verse 10 says, They rose up in their tent door and they worshipped. Now that word worship there actually means to be prostrate on your face. So Israel realised their predicament. They realised they're out of fellowship. They prostrate themselves. It's an acknowledgement of their sin. And Moses hears about that. He sees it. And so he comes back into the camp. And he's going to plead from the camp for his people. That Yahweh might return to them in the person of the angel of his presence. That's what he's going to do. He had presented himself as a substitute. He's now going to present himself as a representative on the basis of the acknowledgement of their sin. Israel is saying, we have sinned. So Moses now returns to the camp. And what he's going to do here is plead for the restoration of the angel of God's presence. See, let's read on. Let's read verse 12. He's now back in the middle of the camp. And Moses said unto Yahweh, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I might find grace in thy sight. And look at the next words. And consider. This is, he wants God to consider. Please consider that this nation is thy people. So here he's pleading for the restoration of the angel. So in verses 13 to 16, Moses acts as a representative of the people from the middle of the camp. But the tent and the cloud are still out here. How's he going to get them back? Well, he gets a positive answer in verse 14. Yahweh says to him, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Moses then responds in verse 15. If thy presence, meaning the angel of his presence, go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people. Notice the language. I and thy people, a representative man, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And Yahweh says to him in verse 17, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou, Moses, hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. If you ever wanted to see a type of Christ as a representative of men, you see it there. 
in Moses. Substitution rejected, representation accepted. But there had to be an acknowledgement of sin first. And that had been the case in verse 10. So he gets his positive answer, his representative status is accepted. But then look what he does. Verse 18. He wants evidence that the angel of presence has returned. Returned to the middle of Israel. So he says in verse 18, you know, this is awesome when you think about it, what he asked for. He said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Give me the proof that the angel of the presence is now back in the middle of your people. But I want to go a step further than what I've already enjoyed. Moses used to talk with this angel face to face. You know what it says at the end of chapter 34? That when he went in to talk with the angel, his face shone when he came out. It was luminous from the glory of the angel's face. And then it would fade. It was like luminosity. It fades. So he would put a veil on his face so Israel didn't see it fade. So that's the experience that he had. He talked with the angel of Yahweh's presence face to face like a man speaks to his friend. That's incredible, isn't it? He's asking to go a step further. He's asking to see the full manifestation of God's personal glory. And God says to him, you can't see it, Moses. You see what he says to him? Verse 19. I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of Yahweh before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said in verse 20, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man, no Adam, see me and live. He's, been, he's asking to see the full manifestation of the glory of God's face. Now, the angel couldn't reveal the full glory. It would have destroyed him. What an incredible request. It's astonishing, isn't it, that a man could make that request of God. But he makes it. And God says, I'll go as far as I can go. So what he tells him is this, in verses, in verses 22 and 23. Sorry, verse 20, the end of that verse. Sorry, verse 21. Yahweh said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass while my glory... Now, here's our words. Here's where it starts. While my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of a rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts as I recede into the distance, but my face shall not be seen. So let's analyse this. He's told that he would be placed in a cave on Mount Horeb or Sinai, somewhere on this mountain. I will make all my goodness pass before thee. In other words, both physical and moral glory. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no Adam see me and live. 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. Whom no man hath seen, nor can see. 21. A cliff. It's a hole, a crevice. I believe it's Elijah's cave. 1 Kings 19 and verse 9. Same cave. Verse 22. And will cover thee with my hand. The word is calf. It means the palm, the hollow or the flat of the hand. That word calf is translated clouds in Job 36 verse 32. So when the angel goes past, he puts out his hand. It's like a cloud that obscures the glory. Now the transfiguration. There was a bright cloud that overshadowed them. Yeah. You need to see the connections. Well, you're going to see a whole lot more. Because this is what happens. Moses ascends the mountain for the final time, the seventh time, the covenant number time. And he goes up, of course, with new tables of stone that the law might be renewed on the mountain. Verses 1, and 1 to 3 of Exodus 34. And when he's there, Yahweh passes by and a voice is heard in verse 5. So let's come to verse 5 of Exodus 34. 
And Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh, look at the words in your Bible, passed by before him and proclaimed Yahweh, 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 merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, etc. So what's happening here, brothers and sisters? Well, the character of God is proclaimed on that mountain in the wake of the passing glory. That's what happens. And then there's a request for Israel to be forgiven. You see what's happening here? Yahweh shows to Moses as much of his glory as he possibly can. But he obscures his vision as he passes by. And then when the glory is receding, a voice emerges, proclaiming the divine character. What's the lesson of that? Well, the lesson is this. Moses, miracles don't change people's characters. But my word does. You know, when you look at people in our brotherhood, who do you regard as the most powerful and most influential? The big talkers? The lucid? You know, the people who make the most noise? People who speak up at business meetings? Pushing their own wheelbarrows? They're the people of greatest influence in the brotherhood? No. I know a lot of people who hardly say a word. But they are so consistent in their behaviour and their characteristics are so like Christ and God that you, 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 you are humbled in their presence. You know that these people have a power that is far greater than any miracle you'll ever see. They are the product of God's word. That's what they are. Which is why I don't believe these words were booming words in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7. I'm going to show you that from 1 Kings 19 in a moment. So Israel is forgiven. Verse 8 and 9, the request for Israel to forgiven is made. In verse 11, Moses is accepted while Israel is reproved. Why are they reproved? Well, they're reproved because, you see, when you read verse 10, it says this, And he said unto me, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people... I will do marvels. God is saying to Israel, to Moses, Israel is only moved by miracles. They only move for a short time. They will not listen to my word. Moses was different. But you know there's an inherent proof here in Exodus 34, in verse 34, that shows that the tent of meeting had returned to the midst of the camp. Because it says there, in verse 34, when Moses went in before Yahweh to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and immediately talked with the elders of Israel. So this tent that would have been taken out as a symbol of God being out of fellowship with Israel is now back in the middle of the camp through Moses' intervention, through his intercession, his acceptance in the sight of Yahweh. That tent is now back and so is the angel of Yahweh's presence with whom he's now talking again in that tent in the middle of the camp. What a remarkable type that is of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the lesson's clear, isn't it? He had asked, show me now thy way. And he was shown God's way. The angel of the presence passed by, manifesting the full glory of God, and the proclamation was made. And here is Rotherham's translation. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God or a power of compassion and favour, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, K said, and faithfulness, Emeth. Verse 10, before all thy people I've got to do marvels because Israel would not respond to the voice. And so this is all summarised in Psalm 103 and verse 7. He made known his ways unto Moses, his character unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. So what kind of people are we, brothers and sisters? People moved by miracle? People moved by the word? That's the question we ask ourselves. Now, let's come to Elijah, shall we? 
We learnt the lesson from Moses. What's, why is he there, the transfiguration? We're well, going to learn that the transfiguration is all about that principle. Look at the miracle. You can be moved by it. You know you haven't followed cunningly devised fables, but it's not going to change you for the kingdom. What will change you for the kingdom is that still, small voice that was heard on the mountain. So let's come to 1 Kings 18 and 19. Now we know, of course, this context pretty well, don't we? Elijah on Mount Carmel calls down fire from heaven. They are humbled. Israel prostrate themselves, crying out, Yahweh, he is God, he is God. They're prepared for education. What, is, what, what, what are we seeing? Miracles make people sit up and take notice. What comes next? Education. What happens in chapter 19? He comes face to face with Jezebel and flees to Mount Horeb. What are you doing down here, Elijah? Why aren't you back instructing my people? Miracles made them sit up and take notice. They need to be instructed. What are you doing down here? Get it? That's your context. So, 1 Kings 18, 44 to 46. Spirit, power and rain. And in running before the chariot of Ahab, impress Ahab and the people. But then he confronts, in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 to 3, the fury of Jezebel, which proves to be far too much for Elijah. And he, he flees in fear for his life to Horeb. In verses 4 to 8, on the way down there, he proves himself to be slow to respond to miracles in his probation. Look what it says in verse 4 of 1 Kings 19. But he himself went a day's journey to the wilderness. He came and sat down under a juniper tree, requested for himself that he might die, and said, It's enough! Take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. He's given up. He lay and he slept under a juniper tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drank and laid him down again. Hang on. Think about that. Put yourself in Elijah. Elijah's shoes. You're out on the juniper. There's not a soul to be seen anywhere. And someone touches you. And wakes you up. Who are you? It's a cake of bread. Oh, much, much, much. <coughs> Snoring again. Huh? Ever had an angel touch you? Did you go back to sleep? No. Here is a man so depressed of mind, he doesn't respond to divine intervention in his life. Israel was slow to respond too. The miracle of Carmel woke them up, but they're slow to respond. What's going to change people for the kingdom? Miracles? No. The word of God. So, so Elijah proves himself to be slow. It happens a second time. And he's still slow. And at verses 9 and 10, he arrives at Moses' cave. Look at verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, and he said unto him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy daughters, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, I only am left. And they're seeking my life to take it away. So he pours out his bitterness and his disappointment to his God on Mount Horeb. And we know why he was here. Because you see, we're told in Romans 11 verse 2 that Elijah went down to Horeb to plead not for Israel, but against Israel. And God has to remind him, mate, there are 7,000 people back there who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. What on earth are you doing here? Get back there and teach them. That's what he's saying. And Elijah is slow. He's very slow, just like Israel was. So here he is on Mount Hor. What happens here, brothers and sisters? Well, precisely the same thing that happened to Moses. I want you to follow me down through verse 11 and 12. And God says to him, Go forth and stand upon the mount before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh 
with the words. Passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before him. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the, earth, after the wind an earthquake. But he wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire. But he wasn't in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. Or as Rotherham beautifully renders it. The voice of a gentle whisper. The voice of a gentle whisper. Which kept on saying. Elijah what are you doing here? Elijah wake up listen. What are you doing here? Kept on speaking until it got through. So what have we got here? Well, we've got three miracles, haven't we? We've got wind. And it passes by. And when it had passed by, there was silence. This wind was so violent, it broke rocks. And they're rumbling down the side of the mountain. The noise, the cacophony is enormous. And the Lord was standing at the cave. He'd been told to get out and stand at the lip of the cave. This is all this, this noise and and, and massive movement of rock going on. And then there's silence. Why? Well, the miracles pass by. Yahweh, who performed the miracle, through an angel obviously, has passed by. It's gone. Then you have that followed, of course, by earthquake. And that passes by. Can you imagine an earthquake on a mountain? And then you've got fire. And that passes by. But Yahweh's not in the wind, earthquake or fire. Well, of course he's in the wind, earthquake and fire. They're miracles. God's power is manifested in those miracles. So what does it mean when it says, but Yahweh was not in the wind, earthquake and fire? It means that he was passed by. He was gone. Just like the glory that Moses saw. It passed by. What comes after that? The voice of a gentle whisper. That's what's being said here. So have a look at what happens to Elijah in verse 13. And it was so when Elijah heard the word, it's not there. When he finally heard this voice of a gentle whisper that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and stood in the entering of the cave. Hang on. I thought he was standing in the entering of the cave at the beginning of verse 11. Well, yes, he was. But where did he end up after wind, earthquake and fire? He ended in the back of the cave with his mantle wrapped around his head because of all the noise of the cacophony. He's, he's afraid. He's fearful. Just like Israel on Mount Carmel were afraid and fearful. Miracles can make you sit up and listen. Miracles can impress. Miracles can make you stand in awe or cringe in the back of a cave. But miracles don't change you for the kingdom. And when he finally heard what Israel was not hearing because he wasn't there to teach them the voice of a gentle whisper he wraps his face in his mantle the symbol of his office prophetic office and comes out and stands at the, at the, at the mouth of the cave what are you doing here Elijah why aren't you back teaching that's the message now that's not plain Look what he then says to him. Look what God says to him after he has miserably repeated his previous words in verse 14. He's slow. Verse 15, Yahweh said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. I've got 7,000 men back there who haven't bowed the knee. Get back there. Start teaching them. Now, you know what he's saying to him? Well, there was wind, earthquake, and fire, wasn't there? Then there was a voice of a gentle whisper. Elijah repeats 
his miserable statement. When he's asked again, what are you doing here, Elijah? Well, go back and anoint Hazael. You know where the winds came into Israel from? From Syria. Hazael would be anointed king of Syria. And anoint Jehu. He brought about the greatest political earthquake in Israel's history. Earthquake. And anoint Elisha, who's called the son of Shaphat, the son of judgment. His first work, the work of judgment. But then what does Elisha become? Well, he becomes God's voice in Israel because some in Israel were ready to listen. You know who anointed these people? Elijah anointed Elisha. He did not anoint Hazael and Jehu. That was left to Elisha, the still small voice in Israel. And so, brothers and sisters, he became for decades the voice of a gentle whisper in that nation to encourage the 7,000 and more to stick with their God because their character was shaped and their faith built up by the teaching of his word. That's the lesson that comes out of the story of Elijah. And if you doubt that, have a look at 2 Kings 2. We are sort of over time by a little way. So pardon me if I go on for another couple of minutes. 2 Kings chapter 2, I'll be quick. What have you got in this chapter? Well, you've got Elijah being taken away. Elijah's going to pass by. You know, I really have let you down. Keep your hand in 2 Kings 2, because I want you to just quickly come back before I consider 2 Kings 2. I want you to come back to 1 Kings 19. Because in my haste, this is a verse I forgot. Verse 19. So he departed thence, so Elijah departed thence from Mount Horeb and found Elisha the son of Shaphat who was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen, read Israel, before him. And he with the twelfth, he was supervising. And Elijah, look at the words, Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him, the symbol of his prophetic office. So Elijah, like wind, earthquake and fire, was going to pass by and leave the still, small voice of Elisha to teach and to educate in Israel. Got it? Well, the time comes in 2 Kings 2 when Elijah does literally pass by. He go, he's taken up by a whirlwind to heaven, we read in verse 11. Did I read a whirlwind? Yes, wind. And then Jordan is divided hither and thither like an earthquake. In verse 8, using the mantle. Earthquake? Yes. Then, Elijah is divided from Elisha by what? A chariot of fire. And horses of fire. Yeah. Wind, earthquake, fire. In the removal of Elijah. The chariots of fire, of course, stay with Elisha, as we know. Elisha represents the persistent, still small voice. Look at verse 2. Elijah says to him, You tarry here, Elisha. And he says, As Yahweh liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went to Bethel. They get to Bethel, he says, Here, you stay here, I'm going somewhere else. Elisha says, Not leaving you. Get somewhere else, he's not leaving you. He's the persistent, still small voice. And the mantle, the very symbol of Elijah's prophetic office, which he takes with him when he's whipped away into heaven to be carried off to Gilead, we believe. He holds the mantle. And Elisha said to him, I want a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah says, if you see me when I go, you'll get it. But he holds the, the very symbol that he put on Elisha's shoulders in chapter 19. He's hanging on to it. And the wind rips it out of his hands and drops it at Elisha's feet and that's the very last thing that Elijah sees of Elisha. His mantle, which we know from Zechariah 13 verse 4, is the symbol of prophetic office, drops at the feet of Elisha, the still small voice. And then we have these 50 sons of the prophets, who in verses 15 to 18 
who are so awestruck by the dramatic events that they have seen that day who don't listen to the still small voice. Elisha says to them in verses 15 through 18, he says, don't go and look for Elijah. Because they come along and say, look, he might have been put somewhere. Can we go? He says, don't go and look for him. Please, don't go and look for him. Please, don't go and look for him. And they go and look for him. And they come back and say, we didn't find him. He says, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? You're impressed by miracles, but you won't listen to the word. And that's what changes people for the kingdom. That, brothers and sisters, is the lesson of the transfiguration. And that is why Moses and Elijah were there. And tomorrow morning, God willing, we'll have a look at Luke 9. See the drama. And you see all the things that we've talked about today focusing in on our Lord Jesus Christ. When we hear the voice... This is my beloved son, here.